Thank you very much. I'll take that applause as a partial sign of success with my struggles with the mask. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with the Great Decisions Program again and to kick off your 2021 program. Uh, I'm sure we all would prefer to be in the comfortable surroundings of AHAC, but for those of you who were able to be here, welcome. And of course, for our listening and viewing audience at home, it's, I'm, I'm very pleased that you're able to come in and that we've been able to make accommodations for you to be able to be with us. Well, since I last spoke with you, the United Kingdom has left uh, the European Union, but it hasn't left it without problems. It hasn't left it as perhaps smoothly as would be desired. And although much of this is masked over by the ongoing pandemic crisis, there still remain a variety of issues that will continue to plague British and European relations and issues that the pandemic itself will serve to exacerbate. And I will get to that near the end of my talk. As a brief overview, though, here is the European Union as it stands today. Um, in uh, gold and dark gold, you have the European Union members. In green, you have the European Free Trade Area members. And of course, in uh, the uh, uh, slightly off brown, you have the United Kingdom itself, which is now in a special relationship, not just with the United States, but with the European Union. Now, the United States, the United Kingdom rather, found itself moving in this direction over the course of several decades of deep political disagreement, primarily within the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, but a disagreement that spread to other political parties as well about the nature of the British relationship with the European Union. The two major parties, the ones that I will uh, address here, but, um, were the British Conservative Party, that's the current government, and the British Labour Party. The British Conservative Party is a traditionally right of center party, relatively favorable towards business and uh, capitalism, um, and has typically endorsed international trade, uh, free, uh, finance, and so forth. But within it, it contains an element that is um, very much a believer in national sovereignty and that sees being involved, especially in the European Union, as something that undermines British flexibility and its ability to operate in the manner in which it best desires. And there's a tension between some in the Conservative Party who saw being part of a broader economic market in Europe with borderless movement of people, goods, services, as providing a great deal of market opportunity for British firms. But the flip side of that was there would also be regulations at the European level with which Britain had an input, um, but that would then have to be imposed in Britain. And these were ones that chafed at people, that, um, and the tabloids in particular were very keen to run stories about the latest indignities coming out of, of Europe and that they would be you know, threatening the, you know, the British sausage and um, uh, uh, various uh, other, other things and efforts at standardization or um, to facilitate uh, the working of a market. Now, on the other hand, the Labour Party was not as keen on having open access to markets because it was a traditional social democratic party with close ties to the union movement, the major funder of the Labour Party, and supportive of much more state intervention in the economy. And they had two different views. On the one hand, there was a group that thought, well, international cooperation is great, and as long as there are conservative governments in power, we can perhaps achieve through Europe, especially in terms of legislation or regulations related to how workers are treated in the workplace, um, things that we cannot achieve electorally in the United Kingdom. That if we want to have you know, uh, um, uh, overtime pay or certain you know, restrictions on hours for workers or other benefits, if we can work a European route in addition to our prospects domestically, this would be good. There was another element that was the sort of flip side of the conservative 
um, capitalist side, which was the national uh, labor side that saw that Europe was really a capitalist scheme. All of this free borders, free goods was all about making capitalism work better and exposing British workers to the vagaries of international markets and that this would put a lot of downward pressure on British wages. It would prevent British governments, especially labor governments, when labor happened to be in power, of pursuing uh, different nationally specific strategies because they could be precluded at the European level. And they found that this might, you know, this uh, you know, capitalist Europe might obstruct a socialist Britain. So you have these tensions within the two major parties over these uh, uh, issues. The minor parties had different attitudes towards it, but were largely um, pro-European. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party was very pro-European. The Scottish Nationalist Party saw Europe as perhaps a vehicle for Scottish independence, that if uh, Scotland could be independent within Europe, um, that this would ease the burden of being out of the United Kingdom. And in Ireland, European Union membership also was rather popular because it could smooth over differences between Catholics and Protestants about their exact relationship with the United Kingdom or the Free Republic to the South, because if they were all part of the European Union and you could move over borders which you know were just lines rather than hard borders, that this was a much easier system for everyone to tolerate, that uh, uh, Catholic nationalists in the North would not feel as if they were entering a foreign country when they went to uh, when they went from Belfast to to Dublin, and at the same time, the Irish uh, loyalists would not feel as if they were part of the Irish Republic if they were all European but British as well. So this served a lot of useful purposes for the minor parties. At the same time, the failure of the Conservative Party to push a more Eurosceptic uh, anti-European agenda led to the rise of uh, what I'll call a third party for the American context, but it's really about the fifth or sixth or seventh party in the uh, British context, initially called the UK Independence Party that um, uh, was uh, quite active. And in 2014, you can see here, in the parliamentary election, European parliamentary elections, in purple, the UK Independence Party, which was a right of center, pro-sovereignty party that um, sort of cut into that element of the conservative party vote, um, but also had some appeal to working class labor voters who didn't want you know, Europeans telling them what to do. You could see there that the UK Independence Party does quite well. In fact, they're the largest party, uh, uh, single largest party in the 2014 European elections. And this put a good scare into the conservatives because they saw a lot of their vote being taken away from them. This was a natural area for them to do well in, but at the same time, they found themselves not being competitive. And if this were replicated in a national election, this would be pretty disastrous for the conservatives. So the second map I have is the subsequent 2015 UK general election. And you can see here, while the UK Independence Party vote slumped to 12.7%, the Conservatives and the Conservatives recovered, it was a pretty near run thing. The Conservative majority is a mere five seats. And the British system, having the majority in Parliament is very good. You get to do whatever you want. There aren't things like filibusters or anything like that or vetoes by you know, presidents you have to deal with. But a majority of five is pretty fragile out of 650 seats. So this was something that the conservatives felt was not a very good thing, and they very clearly blamed the threat from their right of the UK Independence Party. Another thing that I would note here, in both cases, you can see the largest party in Scotland is the Scottish Nationalist Party. Uh, a party which was dedicated to independence for Scotland. And the Conservatives in 2014 had felt they had a bit of a bind here, and the leader of the Conservative Party at the time, David Cameron, thought you know, the Scottish Nationalist Party has won an outright majority in the Scottish Parliament. They win all the parliamentary elections 
in Scotland. We really need to lance this boil, call their bluff, and um, had a referendum on whether Scotland would become independent or not. And, the, uh, and they ran on the campaign of the you know, UK, that Scotland was better together, and they won a narrow majority in favor of Scotland staying in. And it was trumpeted by Boris Johnson, David Cameron, and others as this ends the Scottish issue for a generation. We can put this to rest, put this behind us. And this served as something of a blueprint after 2015 for what the conservatives could uh, then uh, do. So what do you do if you've won a Scottish referendum and you've seen off this challenge to the north by, you know, the fractious mountain people that are always, you know, causing trouble for, for the, the British? Well, you could do the same thing with the European Union. You've got these right of center people, primarily in, in England and Wales, who want to get out of the EU. Let's call their bluff, thought David Cameron. Let's have a uh, referendum. Um, we'll campaign that we're better together, the status quo. We'll say there's no alternative, that it'll be disaster if we choose that. We won't, uh, you know, and um, we'll, uh, 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 you know, vow to, you know, stay the course and get things done. Well, it didn't, unfortunately, in this case, for David Cameron, work out that way. The uh, referendum, in fact, passed. Uh, the uh, 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 nearly 52% of the population voted to leave, and this was sufficient for them to feel that um, they, you know, they had to uh, uh, follow through. David Cameron promptly resigned because he had campaigned very much against it. The majority of the population felt that perhaps the British were better off not together with the European Union. But you can see here, compared with the 2015 general election results, how closely the Leave and Remain campaigns map onto the support for the Conservative Party um, and um, also for the Scottish Nationalist Party. The important things I would highlight about this is a big regional difference. Um, Scotland is overwhelmingly in favor of remaining in, and Northern Ireland very solidly in favor of, of remaining in as well. Um, and uh, as was the uh, 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 Gibraltar, which also voted um, about 98% in favor of remaining in, because for Gibraltar too, um, although only about 40,000 people live there, this is a pretty fundamental question for relations between the United Kingdom and Spain that are important to Gibraltar. If they're all members of the European Union, there's no real issue with the land, border, and sovereignty. But if Britain's out and Gibraltar's out, then all of a sudden you have lots of questions. So you can see how the status quo served their purposes. But the big breakdown was, well, the regional one is important, and we'll see how important later, was also one based upon age. 73% of voters under 25 voted to remain, and 54% of those between 25 and 49 voted to remain. But once you hit 50, your opinions change dramatically. 60% of those who are 50 to 64 voted to leave, 64% of those 65 and over voted to leave. And of course, very similar um, demographic dynamics occur in the United Kingdom as in the United States, that um, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Uh, this um, divide has become even greater in the years since. Um, in uh, 2018 survey, 87% of those under the age of 25 wanted to stay in the, United, stay in the European Union and not leave. Now, shortly thereafter, the Conservatives, you'll recall, had a majority of five. David Cameron resigns. He's replaced by Theresa May, and she campaigns on you know, that you need a strong and stable government that will be able to deliver Brexit. And while the Conservative vote goes up, the Labour vote goes up a lot. Um, the UK independence vote collapses because they've got much of what they uh, wanted. Um, and you can see here that uh, the things did not quite work out as well as Theresa May would have liked. The Conservatives, in fact, lose their majority and become dependent upon Protestants in Northern Ireland for a majority in Parliament. So while it's a stable majority, it is certainly not a strong one. 
And this leads to a variety of uh, difficult um, negotiations with the European Union because it's never clear what Theresa May can get through Parliament. She repeatedly has some of the largest defeats in British parliamentary history for a sitting government as they come up with plan after plan, all of which are unsatisfactory to a majority in Parliament. They can still govern the country, pass regular legislation, but on the key crucial issue of what Britain's relationship in the future after Brexit will be, they do not have an answer that can secure a majority in Parliament. Now, things come to a bit, and the, the big issue, of course, is the Irish issue, one that's uh, you know, proved to plague British politics for several hundred years. And the question is, what do you do with Ireland? You've got Northern Ireland, and you've got the uh, uh, Republic to the south. And if Britain leaves the European Union, do you suddenly <coughs> excuse me, do you suddenly have a land border um, in Ireland? Or do you have some sort of arrangement that can keep the concept of the island as a single entity intact? The peace agreements signed in the late 90s, the Good Friday agreements, um, had set up island, Ireland as a single entity, but these had been done with the European Union as an overarching system, that the British didn't have to worry um, about the border with the Republic of Ireland any more than they really had to worry about the border with France or, or Spain and, and Gibraltar or France had to worry about Germany because Europe was committed to open borders, that this was an area where there wasn't any contention. But part of the point of Brexit was that borders mattered, that Britain was Britain and this was going to be somewhat distinct from the European Union. Britain would have its own trade policy. Goods that came into Britain would come into British standards. But by the same token, goods that went into the European Union would have to have European Union standards. And they would have to be compared at some place and some point. And would that be at the border going into Northern Ireland? Or would it be perhaps on the Irish Sea as they went into at the points of exit from Northern Ireland or entry into what the British call the mainland, um, Scotland, Wales, and England. Where would this be? Well, the Catholics would be fine if there wasn't a land border in Ireland, the Nationalists, but the Protestants, the Loyalists, would be incensed. If there's no border in Ireland, and all of a sudden they have to go through border checks to get to the mainland, does that mean they're outside the United Kingdom. What's the point of being part of the United Kingdom and the Union if when you go into the United Kingdom, if you're in the United Kingdom, you shouldn't have to go through a border to be in the United Kingdom. So this is quite a, uh, a quandary. <coughs> and one of the arrangements that Theresa May had come up with was to sort of, you know, uh, you know, they were trying to muddle through. They called it the Irish backstop, that Britain would stay in the free market until they could come up with a plan to be out of it. And it wasn't entirely clear, of course, what that plan would be, but as long as Britain followed the trade rules and the product rules of the European Union, they could technically be outside of the European Union in terms of sovereignty, but it wouldn't have any great economic or uh, effect on the, the products and the trade that was existing until the politicians could come up with an agreement whenever that might be. Now, you can imagine the real Brexit supporters did not like this at all. They felt this was a, you know, an odious betrayal of what Brexit was. And in fact, while the reality of the Britain in the EU, the, the, anti, the Eurosceptic forces would like to say that Britain was like a colony, Britain in fact took part in the decision-making process and as a big member usually was on the winning side. But if Britain was in a backstop arrangement where they had to be a rule taker, then they would sort of, they actually would be in a colonial circumstance where someone else in another place was making up rules in which you did not have any input and you had to follow them. So it appeared that the Irish backstop, while would be the least disruptive, would also be politically a complete deprivation of sovereignty and the exact opposite of what people who had wanted Brexit would want 
to have. So this was problematic. But, of course, the government was too weak to pass through that or any alternative. Now, in 2019, there's an EU parliamentary election, and a new political party, the Brexit Party, runs. And you can see here, they win pretty much everywhere, except, importantly, north of Carlisle in the United Kingdom, which is to say in Scotland. Um, the Brexit Party wins nearly a third of the vote, the Conservatives are pushed into an ignominious fifth place behind the Green Party. And, sort of ironically, uh, there are two ironies. First, the parties that are in favor of a second referendum will receive a clear majority of the vote, 53%. <coughs> but the Brexit Party, because Britain's a big country and they got a lot of votes, turn out to be the largest single party in the European Parliament, a party committed to leaving the European Union. Well, the, the um, Conservatives have had enough of Theresa May. They replace her with the former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, who'd been the, at the forefront of the Brexit campaign. Um, he becomes uh, prime minister, and he too tries to push things through, leads to lots of resignations from the party, from his cabinet, including his own brother, who's also a Conservative member of Parliament, can't go along with it. Um, and in the end, he's forced to call an election. And in this regard, the parties set up shop here. Uh, and Boris Johnson's message is very clear. Get Brexit done. That is, that's the slogan that they go with. This, you know, this is the one thing we need to do. I'll get it done. Um, the, on the other side, you have the most staunchly pro-European party, the Liberal Democrats with stop a Brexit, you know, build a brighter future for their, their theme. Uh, and they were adamant that if they won the election or formed a government with those who did, they would, would cancel that. Scotland also had a, uh, uh, you know, Scotland's for Europe, and the Scottish voters clearly had voted that way repeatedly, a very strong position for the Scottish Nationalist Party to take. Uh, in the lower left, I have the slogan of the uh, Brexit Party, leave means leave. Um, again, a fairly clear message. And then Labour, which was very much waffling on this, because there were two wings of the party, as I discussed earlier. Those who saw Europe as a capitalist cabal, and they were best rid of it, and those who thought that this was a way towards a more cosmopolitan, labor-oriented, environmentally friendly, uh, progressive future. So Labour took the, you know, the wishy-washy position, if you will, and the leader of the Labour Party was someone who was opposed to the European Union, Jeremy uh, Corbyn, and um, the majority of the party itself was probably pretty, you know, probably about two-thirds in favor. Um, but they had this big divide, and they took the sort of waffling position that they would let the people decide that uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn would come up with a better deal if he were prime minister, and then the British people could vote on it. And if they voted to stay in, they stayed in, and if they didn't, they didn't. So there was a bit of uh, buck passing uh, there, but clearly in favor of a second vote for people. And the hope was that everyone could read what they wanted into, into that. Well, here's how the results came out. It was a pretty decisive uh, victory for Boris Johnson. Although the second referendum parties got more than half the vote, but, you know, we're in the United States, so, you know, we're aware of how sometimes the way you draw district boundaries and stuff can lead to different outcomes. And the British political system in terms of parties is quite fragmented. If you have a, a party that's regionally concentrated, like the Scottish Nationalists, you can get a relatively small number of votes and end up with a, quite a large number of seats. Um, by the same token, you can get a lot of votes, um, as the Liberal Democrats did, and if it's spread pretty thin, um, you might end up with very few seats. So the Conservatives win the biggest uh, majority um, for a Conservative Party since 1979, and the greatest share of the vote for a Conservative Party since the time of Margaret Thatcher. It gives you an idea, though, of the level of fragmentation of British politics, even as we think of the landslides that people like Tony Blair had, that they only really were at the level of 42 or 43 percent of the vote. Um, they just happened to be more than anyone else in their districts. But still, a quite a major and substantial victory 
for the Conservative Party, and it did enable Boris Johnson to say, look, I've got a mandate from the people. I'm going to get Brexit done, that, and that's what we're going to do. Now, interestingly, within this, again, a similar demographic profile shows up in the, the votes um, of, uh, of how people were. Um, oh, the majority of voters um, who were under the age of 35 um, supported the Labour Party, just flat out. The majority of voters under the age of 45 supported either Labour or the Liberal Democrats. Um, and you don't get up to about 46% of the vote until you get over 45. Um, and then by the time you get 65, 64% of the voters are favoring the Conservative Party. So again, you can see a very clear age imbalance. Those who are younger support the pro-European parties in large measure. Those who are older support the more Eurosceptic, um, or the more capitalist party, the uh, uh, Conservatives. So Boris Johnson wins this election and has pretty much a free hand in ratifying things in Britain, but he has a bit of a you know, more difficult hand dealing with the Europeans because he still has to get an agreement that would work for them. And domestically, there are some tensions as well. The projections that we have economically of putting up border um, uh, uh, controls on the border, high, raising tariffs, disrupting supply chains, they're pretty substantial. You can't just um, uh, put restrictions on people and expect it to run as smoothly as it did when you didn't have all of these uh, uh, barriers. So here are two projections um, from uh, how things are. And what's interesting about both of these is that um, it also incurs, includes uh, the results of you know, the projections from the pandemic, which are dramatic, but they're much less substantial than the impact of Brexit. And I'll just walk you through these. Up until 2019, 2020, the black line is what the GDP was or the unemployment levels were. I'll talk about the GDP first. Those were the real unemployment levels. And prior to the UK, uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, the uh, pink line shows what the forecast was should the UK have stayed in the European Union on the same terms it always had. A pretty steady uh, uh, growth track there. But if they left, the forecast before the virus is the gray line. And you can see over the course of about a decade, the UK GDP would be about 10% uh, smaller um, uh, in real terms, but an annual hit of about 7% or 7% overall. Um, now, the, once the pandemic comes along, you can see that in the blue and the yellow lines, obviously a big drop, right? Um, so the yellow line says, well, here's what the things would look like if you didn't have a deal at all, that um, you have to go to default trading arrangements in the same way you know, the European Union does with, say, Botswana, someone who they don't have a, a trade agreement with. That would be the default international standard. Um, now, if you could get to a free trade agreement, you'd be a bit better. You'd be at the blue line. But you can see in both cases how much worse off um, Britain would be either than staying in the EU. And of course, you see the loss from the uh, pandemic. The pandemic, the long term, hits about 3% of, of GDP. Um, the Brexit hits about 7%. So 10% hit by 2019, only a third of which is attributable to the uh, pandemic. And it could be um, somewhat more due to uh, uh, you know, about twice as much as from Brexit. Um, the same with unemployment. Um, the initial uh, hit is pretty clear because a lot of people in Britain are engaged in industries involved in export or transport or tourism or other activities that if all of a sudden you start having additional controls on getting to Europe, um, doing exchange with Europeans, then you're going to have less engagement with them. Now you might have more engagement in some of these areas with people in Britain, but usually at a higher cost and also lower levels of volume because now instead of dealing with a broad European wide market, you're dealing with the much smaller British market. So there'd be a modest increase of unemployment. Now, of course, you can see here as well, once you put um, the gold line in when the pandemic hits, how that um, dwarfs much of, of that. But still, the uh, UK's uh, unemployment levels will also be affected 
pretty clearly as well. A much more modest effect on the employment levels than on the wealth of the country. Because the governments tend to be able to find jobs for people, but are the jobs as well paying? Are they as productive as they would otherwise? If you're just selling your goods to people, or as most of your goods to people in the United Kingdom, you know, you're going to get a lower price than if you can get access to international markets. There are more people bidding for uh, things there. So unemployment, not as much of a problem in, for Brexit, but certainly in terms of the wealth of the country, much more so. So what does Boris Johnson comes up, come up with? Well, they come up with a few things that are very clever and a few things that are fairly uh, straightforward. The main sticking point, there was a technical negotiation, was what they called the divorce bill. Lots of Britons worked for the European Union. Um, they were getting pensions. The government had to, had to contribute to that. Um, at the same time, there are a large number of European level programs that the British government contributed to and benefited from that they had to unwind. Um, and they'd get some money back from what they'd contributed. And then there were other areas where Britain had received benefits and, and had received you know, a number of benefits over the years that they would have to pay back. Turns out the amount of money is about 25 billion pounds be paid back between now and roughly 2060, depending upon how long British uh, uh, citizens uh, stayed working for the European Union. Um, but um, most of the money, about three quarters of it, would be paid in the next four years in various uh, amounts as the commitments were, were un unwound from the previous European budgets. Still, the, Euro the United Kingdom stayed in several European projects. The Euratom Euro program, nuclear program for Europe, the British stayed a uh, part of, uh, you know, highly technical, highly specialized area, um, and Britain being able to go it alone in the nuclear realm uh, is probably not a viable option. The benefits of European cooperation in such a crucial area were very, very substantial. And also intriguingly, in the uh, Copernicus program, which is a European satellite program for monitoring uh, uh, the Earth's climate and surface, uh, Britain would otherwise have to develop its own um, you know, space agency and space products, and in this area they, they continue to contribute. But most other areas, they did not. Now, the crucial area uh, to come up with a solution was Ireland. And they came up with a very sort of British solution. There's the de jure solution, the legal solution, and then there's the de facto solution, what's happening on the ground. The de jure solution, the legal arrangement, is there's a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, and that's legally the border. But the de facto solution is goods could go back and forth between the Southern Republic and Northern Ireland without any interference, and um, they only would, and the British would implement border checks, or European customs officials would enter, would have border checks only when they had what they called goods at risk of going from the from Northern Ireland over to the United Kingdom. So Ireland, Northern Ireland, remains within this area, but there are border checks in the Irish Sea. Now, of course, this is not what was promised to the uh, um, Irish loyalists, the Protestants, and Boris Johnson had famously gone to Northern Ireland and said, well, you know, this is, there's not going to be any paperwork, and if you get any paperwork for sending goods to the United Kingdom, throw it in the bin. Well, if anyone were to follow the Prime Minister's advice these days, they would get into uh, serious trouble because the British bureaucracy does enforce its rules and the rules they have have lots of checks for all of the European customs arrangements when goods depart Northern Ireland. And this has caused some tension with the, um, uh, uh, within the sectarian communities, the loyalists in particular, very distressed by this. And for a period of time last week, um, there were, um, you know, uh, uh, European officials at these border ports were threatened, followed home. Um, graffiti was put up threatening them, and um, there were uh, concerns that this was, you know, you know that, that this was going to be interfering with uh, uh, trade. These officials wouldn't be safe because some people in Northern Ireland saw this as denying that they were part of the United Kingdom and that these foreign officials on British soil were implementing a border between Ireland 
and the United Kingdom. So it's a source of, uh, well, it will be a source of ongoing uh, uh, tension. Um, the next area was a trade agreement, and this one came down to Christmas Day, just about six days before the agreements were to get into effect. But Britain did get, in large measure, a free trade agreement um, with the uh, European Union that, um, that pretty much reduced tariffs and um, quotas that where you might say, oh, you can only send a certain amount of a product. It's one popular form of trade restriction. So this was very um, much in Britain's interest and very much in the Europeans' interest. But there were still some caveats because you didn't want, the Europeans don't want things to be exported into Britain and then re-exported into them at lower levels. So at the moment, the one issue that has come up it's a, a small one, but, um, uh, but a serious one. It gives you an idea of, uh, you could think how it might apply in other areas. There's evidently developed a used clothing mountain in the United Kingdom. British charities collect used clothes, and then they sell them in Eastern Europe, um, uh, particularly in the Baltics, um, to raise money for British charities. Now, as with most clothing and t-shirts, they're made in China. So... Um, they're not really made in Britain. In fact, they're discarded. They're worn in Britain, discarded in Britain, and then shipped overseas. So what do you do when you send them to Latvia? Well, when you were a member of the European Union, you just send them to Latvia. And they, you know, they unload them, and um, you sell them, and you pocket the money. But if they were a Chinese good, you're really re-exporting them. You might have worn them and discarded them, but you're re-exporting them. Um, and there's not any you know, value added in Britain. If anything, there's value detracted in Britain, and so should you then have to pay the European Union's tariffs on Chinese textile products, 6.3%, when you send it from Britain into Latvia. And you have to then check to see if they're made in China or Indonesia or anywhere else. That's a bit of a problem, but if you're in the charity sector in the United Kingdom, this matters a great deal because you have to get these clothes checked, you have to pay more, there's less money for your charities in the UK. So they've been piling up all of this uh, clothing because they can't figure out how to fill out all the paperwork they previously would not have had to fill out. But you can imagine how this could happen across not just um, used clothes, but across a range of products that the European Union would want to check on, that they don't want the, the British to be someplace where you, you ship stuff in and then you ship it on to uh, Europe. So that interferes with the movement of goods, and um, um, you also have similar arrangements with labor. Certain professions are able to move visa-free, but others are not, and those are still subject to negotiation. It's going to continue to be an ongoing process. In large measure, um, security cooperation, though, has continued between Britain and uh, Europe, particularly in the areas of anti-terrorism. One area the British have pulled back from is the European arrest warrant. The British, um, for a variety of reasons, have always been suspicious of um, British, the British citizens having to face foreign justice. Um, and it crops up every few years. The tabloids during the summer will often, usually some British citizen in, will have gone to the Gulf states, they'll have committed you know, some sex offense or, um, you know, prostitution or something, and then there'll be all of these um, conniptions about being subject to foreign justice. But similar things came out in terms of whether or not, you know, German or Portuguese or Romanian authorities could um, extradite a British citizen um, under the EU. They could, and this was considered one key point of sovereignty that a British court should have to pass on this, not simply a court in a fellow EU member. So there are some issues there, but the main issues re relating to counterterrorism, surveillance, and other activities, the level of cooperation remains quite high. Of crucial concern for the British, um, and an area in which they failed was getting open access, guaranteed open access to European financial markets. The City of London is the premier financial, uh, financial spot in the world. The European Union has a few cities, Paris, Frankfurt, among others, that would like to you know, get a bite out of that uh, business. Uh, and um, at the moment, there's no guarantee that London will be able to operate, or firms based in London will be able to operate on the same terms they did before Brexit. And that's a huge element of the British economy, one of the real engines of 
uh, growth. So this was, and the city was always very strongly in favor of European uh, uh, membership for uh, this reason. But um, to figure out how this will work out still remains to be seen, but certainly a large number of the big financial firms have started moving some of their staff to Europe, because if you want to be able to issue loans in a country, um, mortgages and other financial products to businesses, uh, you need to be established uh, there. It used to be you could do it from Britain and do it for businesses elsewhere. Now it's a little iffier. Uh, fisheries have always been a big uh, issue. Britain felt they, you know, they, you know, you get uh, back control of their uh, fishing areas. There's a modest element of getting control back, but since Britain's biggest market for fisheries is the European Union, it's a bit of a, a wash, and there are some um, potential problems there because the Europeans are starting not to allow the landing of live fish from British trawlers in Europe because they have health and safety concerns, and when you bring in products from foreign countries, as we all have probably experienced on, you know, when you come into the U.S., you have to fill out the USDA form, and, you know, there's often a dog that sniffs around, and you have to do the same in, in Europe going the, the other way, or, you know, you end up with, like, um, you know, Australia, and you're overpopulated with rabbits, right? Um, so the... Europeans have started to enforce these restrictions on, you know, live shellfish and things of that nature in the last uh, month or so. And again, something to be negotiated out, but not quite what was um, planned. So these are all issues that have um, come up, but they also have a reflection in Britain's relationship elsewhere. And the big thing that the British had wanted to be able to do was sign their own trade agreements. This would enable them to be dynamic. Um, and the biggest of the trade agreements they would have, outside of the European Union, which is 50% of their trade, would be with the United States. And there are a variety of tensions within that. Um, the UK trades about uh, a quarter of the level of trade with the US as it does with the European Union, um, and there are various sticking points. The first is the National Health Service. The US has a very competitive private health care industry, you know, quite technologically advanced. Britain has a famously state-run national health system. So the US would stand to benefit if they could introduce some elements of privatization into that system. The British are adamantly opposed to that. Um, the US also has a big farming sector that is interested in getting access to British markets. Um, Britain has a small farming sector, so on the one hand, they might be amenable to that, um, but on the other hand, their farmers probably do not want to be in com competition with the uh, uh, you know, big American um, agro businesses. And by the same token, Britons have a different attitude, as do Europeans in general, towards food, food safety, than Americans do. Um, the, uh, the, British, the British tabloid manifestation of this is the chlorinated chicken crisis, um, that um, European and British um, chickens are usually not at the factory farm level that we have in the United States. They're much more likely to be free-ranging, and um, when you clean them up and prepare them, they're all washed in water. Uh, the United States has these giant, uh, you know, factory uh, farm things where the chickens are all in cages. They're, you know, filled up with stuff, and then at the end, they're dunked in, in chlorine to get rid of whatever diseases they might have, have uh, had. And the Europeans and the British think this is not particularly good for um, their health, and they've put restrictions and don't allow the importation of chlorinated uh, uh, chicken. Um, but this would obviously be something that the big American chicken producers would want to get access to, um, and so they would um, have some pressure there. I mean, if you've seen the movie uh, Chicken Run, which in some ways combines two aspects of Brexit, the sort of, uh, 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 it's a uh, claymation film made in Britain. It's based around the movie The Great Escape, Steve McQueen, but the uh, prisoners are in fact clay uh, chickens, um, and the evil plan of the farmers is to create a factory uh, system for, um, you know, cutting up the chickens instead of getting their eggs. So you get this sort of nice rural area, but threatened by industrialization and mass, uh, mass production. Uh, another area of, of great concern is uh, the, with the Americans is genetically modified organisms. The Europeans and the British have always pursued 
a uh, precautionary principle that you have to uh, prove things are safe before you introduce them. The Americans have taken the alternate approach that you can use it unless the evidence demonstrates that it's, uh, that it's not. Um, and so this has kept a large amount of American uh, food products out of the United Kingdom. And then there's some other issues that uh, big American manufacturers would like to have access to. Um, you're probably familiar that some goods produced in some areas are the only ones that can use that name. Like to be real champagne, it has to come from the Champagne region of, Spain, of uh, France. Um, if you have a similar product and it's from you know, Australia, you have to call it you know, sparkling wine or something. Um, uh, Cornish pasties are one example of this for the United Kingdom, that um, popular product, but um, there's a fear that if, uh, but they have to be uh, produced in Cornwall um, to a certain standard that's determined by the British. Um, so if the Americans can start mass producing this in you know, Kansas City and shipping them around the world, that might be a, pro a problem. But the big American food manufacturers might very well want to be able to do this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, thing. So those are sort of issues that have, have uh, come up both with Europe and with the United States. And you see some of them occurring already, like simply the moving of, of um, uh, between gardening centers in Northern Ireland and Ireland, if you have uh, you know, flowers or whatever, you're, you're, you're not allowed in, anymore to just move them because you're moving live soil. And moving live soil from one environment to another or one country to another, if you don't have a rule on it, um, you go to your default rules. And the default rules in Ireland and Britain and elsewhere are, well, you know, we don't just let people bring in dirt from other countries. There's stuff in them. So for as, as a health and safety measure, we don't allow that. The other issue that it's pulled up again, that the British had thought had been settled for a generation, is uh, separatism, particularly that in Scotland. The Scottish had been sold just a few years before, were better together. Um, you know, they'd barely voted to stay in. They'd voted overwhelmingly to stay in the European Union, also on the theory we're better together, and they have to leave against their will. So the Scottish think, well, I'm not so sure we settled this for a generation now because we settled staying in Britain in the European Union for a generation, but that deal's off the table. So the Scottish Nationalist Party is back up to it, suggesting that this should be reconsidered. Of course, one of the strong arguments against Scottish independence was the flip side of that chart that I showed you about the loss of British economic uh, growth and unemployment, a similar dynamic would occur in Scotland if there were you know, a border erected at Hadrian's Wall and, um, uh, uh, and Scotland went its, its own way. So there certainly are concerns there. Uh, and, and the pandemic has served um, in some ways to exacerbate this problem because the Scottish government has sought to take more aggressive measures um, uh, in that regard than, uh, than the Johnson government, the conservative government down in London has. And, it, and there's a good deal of tension that the central government is not helping out as much as the Scottish government would like. There's also similar feelings in Wales and Northern Ireland that the uh, central government's not, not performing up to the level they would want. And Scotland, that manifests itself by thinking, if we were independent, we could do this a lot better. Um, other issues come up that, uh, uh, um, that sort of that the Scottish consider slight indignities, like when they have um, when they have general election campaigns and they have leaders' debates. It's between the leaders of the Conservative, Liberal Democrat, and Labour Party. But the Scottish Nationalists argue, you know, we're the leading party in Scotland. We're the third largest party in the United Kingdom. We should be part of any of these debates as well. Um, but the, you know, the British um, say, well, you're only polling at 5% and you're only running candidates in Scotland, so you're not really a, you know, you're not really a, a United Kingdom-wide party. And so there's that tension there. And the Scottish leaders, the nationalists, find this quite offensive. Um, and it says, yeah, this just goes to show we really aren't part of the system. We're second-class citizens. So those pile on um, and continue um, to be the case. The final issue that's come up um, and is the pandemic. And some of the responses to this have shown both perhaps the opportunities, but also the tensions of not being a member of the European Union. On the one hand, Britain's got carte blanche to pursue its own arrangements for vaccines and, 
and uh, um, access. On the other hand, production of vaccines is clearly uh, uh, something that occurs at an international level. The European Union, whatever its other faults, is exceptionally good at distributional politics and spreading things out um, um, between different people and countries that want things. Um, and vaccine cooperation has worked pretty well within Europe. But the Europeans have been having a feud with one of the manufacturers, that the Europeans thought they uh, had, had been promised 400 million doses. The company based in Belgium is not providing them the level they want, and the Europeans uh, want to start putting restrictions on the export of them to third parties. Um, in much the same way, you know, the United States might be concerned if we're producing lots of a vaccine, do we start shipping them off to other countries or do we inoculate our citizens uh, first? Now, if Britain were part of the European Union, they'd be part of this um, big uh, effort in figuring that out. But being outside the European Union, they're on par with other countries that might be um, getting um, these uh, vaccines. And that's creating some tensions because the supply networks for the major pharmaceutical companies stretch all over Europe um, in uh, per particular. So while things might be developed in Britain, they might be manufactured in um, Belgium or Germany or vice versa. It could go either way. And there was a bit of a crisis last week when it was felt that, this, uh, uh, the, that too, many, too many vaccines were being shipped over the border um, from Ireland into Northern Ireland. And perhaps they weren't staying in Northern Ireland, they were going into the United Kingdom. So that what was the back stop had become a back door and that the British were gonna suck out all of these European manufactured vaccines, taking advantage of the single market arrangements in Ireland and shooting them across to the British mainland. And that was considered you know, not a very good idea. Europeans started threatening to implement border controls in Ireland to make sure this wasn't happening. Um, then, the, uh, then the Irish and the British got very upset and they backed off. But you can see how these tensions about sovereignty, especially in pressing issues like vaccinations or other health, safety, security areas, might start coming to the fore. So I think that's a small microcosm of uh, the sorts of problems that might develop. And this is, of course, a very serious one because if the, you know, if the UK can suddenly funnel in a whole lot more vaccines, they could, you know, they're a relatively wealthy country. Some of the others are not. They might be able to outbid the European countries, get these vaccines, um, and get many more of them before everyone else, which, you know, if you're Britain, that would be good, but the Europeans would not like it. And you could see how, in the interest of their own sovereignty, they might want to curtail exports. So those are sort of the, uh, uh, just a small window into the issues that Brexit is raising and will continue to raise as it goes forward. A lot of it is still subject to negotiation as these problems emerge because some of them are, are likely unanticipated. They've got an agreement down, but it's got to be nuanced um, and worked out. And in the end, what Britain will have done is, is traded one set of deep international agreements their old relationship with the European Union for a new set of international agreements, those that they were you know, negotiating directly with the European Union. And whether they're for the better or for the worse for Britain would remain to be seen. So with that, I will uh, close things down and turn it over for questions.